Okay, thanks. Uh, it has been started the recording. So uh, this is my pleasure to welcome you in this uh, intro to the web, uh, intro webinar series. And uh, before I give the floor to, to our first presenter, let me just uh, highlight uh, a couple of uh, themes that we are really interested uh, about that. Uh, so this is uh, the liquidity project financial market infrastructure. And uh, we had the pleasure to give some uh, some introduction previously. Uh, last time it was the Money View Symposium and uh, the recording is available there. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, we, uh, we, we try to uh, provide a floor to meet uh, uh, supervisors, uh, decision makers, academic thinkers, independent think thinkers and practitioners uh, in, uh, in order to uh, to get uh, a chance to uh, our community, which uh, consists uh, consists mostly uh, young scholars uh, in their early uh, uh, early professional lives or uh, in their researches. Uh, the, this initiative started uh, quite uh, long ago, so uh, we, uh, we we met. Uh, 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 actually, I joined the first session in 2020, but uh, the first uh, event was in Goethe University and then it was in Shanghai and uh, uh, from uh, 2019 it, uh, it is in, in Frankfurt. And uh, the, this uh, the main organizer of this event is uh, uh, Kiko. And uh, we, we built a huge uh, uh, database about uh, uh, these uh, projects and, uh, and videos and lectures. And one of the, uh, the, the aim of today's uh, forthcoming sessions that we would like to expand this uh, database. And uh, in case you are familiar with the uh, YSI directory, project directory, you can find many, many projects uh, involved uh, in this uh, in, uh, in initiative. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that uh, this is a community-wide uh, uh, project because we just, uh, I'm, I'm the coordinator of the Financial Stability Working Group, but uh, there are three more working groups which are really involved and interested about this uh, uh, liquidity project, uh, financial market infrastructures. This is the uh, 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 economic development, innovation, and uh, law and uh, finance. And uh, for example, that uh, uh, YSI is going to have a really nice conference next week in, in Boston. And one of the keynote is uh, Andres Arauz uh, from, uh, from Ecuador, but he also uh, attended when he was a PhD student, uh, uh, an event. And uh, then he, he did, uh, he did, did a debrief like uh, Sibulel is going to, to, to share today. And uh, that that recording is is available, and I, I, I recommend to watch it. And uh, we we not only uh, focus on the on, uh, online uh, sessions and the database, but we really uh, prefer to meet in person because uh, we think that uh, yeah, in person meetings. And uh, for example, I I've never met with uh, Alex in person, but I hope that next week we're gonna meet in person. And uh, finally. Uh, but you can see that uh, there are uh, many, many events that we, we get when we get together. Uh, the last year we, uh, it was in, in, in London and in Frankfurt. And uh, for about the event in Frankfurt, Sibulala uh, is going to, to give some uh, give some inputs of, of first. But before that, let me let me shortly uh, introduce Sibulala. Uh, uh, and uh, please correct me if I if I'm wrong, but. Uh, uh, you, you studied at the Bremen University and you did your, your master in, in the SOAS in, in London, UK, and you, you are a member of an academic uh, uh, community, uh, Her Majesty's, or maybe it is now His, His Majesty's uh, Young Scholars uh, Network. And now uh, you, you started to, to work uh, based in Berlin in, in many companies as a senior advisor, and currently you are working at the uh, Stocks. Uh, remotely, uh, Stocks is uh, really close to the to to, to Frankfurt, and um, so uh, if I uh, uh, missed anything, but uh, and you you are uh, South African based, uh, 
as, as, as we, 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 we discussed. And please, uh, the floor is yours and uh, I'm looking forward to your, your presentation, Sibulela. Thank you again for yeah. accepting this invitation. Of course, thank you so much, Adam, um, for the introduction. Um, is it possible if you could make the slides maybe on presenter mode? And then I will... Yes, just... uh, yes, oh. sorry, it is... Uh... <laughs> No problem. But yes, in the meantime, uh, um, I think thanks for the introduction. Yes, I'm South African um, by origin, and I did um, study my master's in development economics at the SOAS University, focusing on development economics and also financial um, systems infrastructures, um, mainly from an African perspective. But at the moment, I am working in the sector um, for stocks, or the company is also known as Contigo. And um, what we do is index um, engineering, which I will also talk about um, in, in the later slides. So um, for today, I would uh, just provide a, a quick recap um, on the liquidity project, um, financial market infrastructure spring conferences, which took place last year. So as a note, these conferences um, took place in London and in Frankfurt, and I'll be focusing mainly on the Frankfurt leg which uh, was kindly hosted by the European Central Bank and um, the UREX. You can go to the next slide, please, Adam. Can you go to the next slide, please, Adam? Uh, sorry, maybe uh, I should uh, restart, restart the sharing of the screen because uh, uh, it seems that it doesn't. I, I see the. Uh, the slide China's rise and digitalization, but uh, I, I suppose that you don't don't see that because I put it no, in a, actually, in a present sorry. mode. Okay, never yeah. mind. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Uh, is that's, it okay? That's that's fine. Exactly. Thanks a lot. So yeah, for today's uh, quick recap, I was hoping to go a bit more in depth into some of the papers that were presented during the conference. But I think, um, given the time, and apologies again from our side for starting a little bit later than planned, I'll just provide um, a summary of some of the topics. But I think it's worthwhile to maybe go over the background of the conference. So the idea was to maybe revisit um, the geopolitical um, assessments and also the digital innovation through liquidity theories and mar financial market infrastructure. So that was the general concept of the presentation. And um, we're looking into understanding what are some of the liquidity problems that are experienced by financial market um, institutions and um, the idea was to bring the YSI scholars, protectioners from the public sector. So we had some speakers from the ECB, for example, and also from the private sector. So we also had the chief strategy officer for UREX join us um, for the conference and um, mainly to just stimulate research um, within the YSI um, liquidity project to understand what are some of the gaps in the research and where we could potentially fit in. So it was a great um, overview, um, a great section to also just bring together people who are coming from different perspectives. And um, the conference was three days and it was hybrid. So we had scholars joining us online and also on site at the ECB and later at the UREX forum. It was three days. So the first day was more of an academic uh, workshop where we went through various papers by different speakers. Some of them are also speaking later today. So if you have time, I would really encourage that you stay on for the sessions to listen to some of these speakers, the, the talks that they provide. So in summary, I would say the three days really focused on three overarching themes. So the first one was the rise of China, really looking at um, some of China's uh, financial um policies at the backdrop of its increasing uh, political and uh, financial dominance in the global sphere. Um, we also looked into digitalization. Here we are coming from the perspective that um, there's regulatory gaps 
given the rapid um, innovations and decentralization, and then trying to understand what would the impact be on market um, liquidity and mm -hmm. robust uh, financial infrastructures. And then um, we looked at uh, systemic risk, um, looking mainly into central clearing parties, also known as CCPs, um, trying to understand what are some of the benefits and um, disadvantages. So here, actually, Adam provided a very good um, introduction to CCPs, where he also sh um, showed us maybe some of the benefits, which are providing uh, financial markets e efficiency and also reduce risk. Um, but what we learned later on is that it can also concentrate um, risk and um, create contagion effects. So there's still more research uh, definitely required um, for CCPs. Um, but at the moment, the general consensus is that uh, the, the positives actually outweigh the negatives. So that's just the general um, summary of how the um, presentations were uh, categorized. You can go to the next slide, please, Adam. So um, just to give more insight on the section about China. So we had the first speaker who was, um, I think he's also speaking this afternoon, um, David Zhang from the New Development Bank. Here he presented um, the concept of uh, dual security in the Chinese economy and how they are using that um, for their industrial upgrading. So what this means is essentially keeping China competitive to the international world, so increasing exports internationally, but at the same time also strengthening uh, domestic demand. So here he walked us through how this policy um, has been implemented from the domestic demand side um, in China and also from the supply side. So as mentioned from the demand side, the idea is really trying to improve um, domestic consumption in China but um, also removing bottlenecks, so movements of goods within China. So removing um, localism, so regional purchasing, rather um, moving towards national purchasing. But at the same side, opening up to exports in uh, for foreign companies, but also allowing um, foreign companies to come and operate within China with the main benefit um, that um, Chinese firms can inc increase their supply chain standards and also um, learn from foreign companies. So um, he used this tagline, profits for you and learning um, by me. And the idea from here is then to move um, from um, downstream production up to upstream production. So we also had a lively discussion after that, considering um, also deindustrialization, which is happening in a lot of emerging economies. After that, we also we had Alexandra from um, NYU Shanghai. He's known as Sasha, and I think he's also presenting later today, where he presented his paper on assessing um, the policy direction of the renminbi as a global currency. So the research that he presented starts off from the context of the, to the post-2015 Chinese crisis and also looking into where the renminbi could play um, in the global sphere. So here he argued that maybe it's not um, suitable as a reserve currency, but has a lot of opportunities as a payment intermediary. And how um, at that time his paper was a working paper. So you looked into mapping um, how the renminbi could be used from maybe a payments um, framework, from a security transactions, and um, from the money flows. So as mentioned, it's still a working paper, at least uh, last year when you presented it. So um, there was no con conclusion at the moment what exactly the policy direction will be, but um, it had strong indications that whatever the solution will be, it has to be market and also partnership um, driven. You can uh, move to the next slide, please, Adam. Then um, moving towards uh, what we discussed under the digitalization um, uh, pillar. So here we had um, someone from the European Central Bank, uh, Patrick Pepperstoff, where he walked us through um, the concept of the PISA framework. So the PISA framework is the payments instruments, schemes, and assessments. And um, this is coming from the uh, background that the ECB has the ba basic mandate for um, smooth um, and functioning uh, financial market systems. And of course, um, payment instruments there play a very key role. So what they are trying to achieve um, with the PISA framework is to have a harmonized and a future-proof and a technology um, 
neutral solution. And um, what they're doing is essentially categorizing um, different payment um, institutions into the ones that need to be uh, monitored the most, therefore maybe having more regulatory um, conditions um, to the ones who need to not so much um, be as monitored or are even exempt from the PISA framework. And here you also highlighted that the instruments that have the biggest um, size, maybe in scale, or the biggest significance are the ones who are then uh, monitored the most and are put with more uh, regulatory frameworks. Then we had um, George uh, Petalopoulos from the University of Newcastle, the one in Australia, where he um, actually discussed um, the holy grail of cross-border payments. So this was coming from the context um, that cross-border payments are an uh, important strategy for the G20. Um, this is taking into account that, for example, um, cross-border communication is more or less free and um, is not mirrored into cross-border payments, and that there's actually opportunity to also improve cross-border payments, and this solution is probably um, in the near future. So um, taking that into account, um, they're writing a paper to understand what would make a really good cross-border payment system. And for them, the holy grail is it's being cheap, uh, being secured, and being immediate. Um, and one of the key criteria besides um, this framework is that this uh, should be be competitive and still maintain uh, financial systems layering. And um, so on the other side, um, to maintain this financial systems layering, you should uh, um, avoid uh, global st uh, stable coins, but also make sure there is still a clear lender of um, last resorts. Then we had uh, Martin Seiter from also from the ECB, where he walked us through um, the evolution of bond and swap trading. So this was taken from the context of the liquidity crunch that took place um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, where there was a lot of um, organizations and firms were also strapped for cash and then went to liquidate um, their bonds. Um, so before he actually showed what are the results between the US and the EU, he also provided a theory um, that uh, bond swaps are becoming more decentralized and that dealers within the sector have moved from propriety trading to market making and then to matchmaking. And um, what he found um, from his research is that actually um, the US market deteriorated more than the European market um, when it comes to bond trading during the COVID pandemic. And what um, helped the European market was um, because of uh, programs such as um, asset purchasing, which was led by the European Central Bank, also uh, collateral requirements uh, for these trades, and also, again, access to European Central Bank. So based on these key learnings of what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic, he actually stressed the fact that we do need um, better policy to actually manage future liquidity crunches that may occur due to uh, bond um, trading. So um, he recommends maybe monitoring CCPs and also to avoid um, the instances where people dash uh, for cash. And in this case, maybe selling even good investment bonds um, prematurely just to gain access um, to cash. Then um, we talked about systemic risk. Um, we had a very good um, roundtable uh, discussion um, led by Kiko, who's here in this call today, and also Robert Steigold from the Reserve Bank of Chicago. So this was under Chatham House rules because the conversation that was being discussed was very um, prevalent and salient at the moment. So I can't give in too much depth into what the conversations, the direction the conversation took. But here, um, I know also I appreciate that um, FTX has been in the news a lot lately um, as an organization, but um, we weren't focusing on FTX per se, but rather um, if institutions, uh, crypto traders like FTX can um, provide uh, direct clearing. So it was a very good conversation trying to balance out um, innovation in these sectors and um, current market demand for more trade, for more cryptocurrencies, therefore faster clearing, 
and also regulation, and also what that means um, in the context of contagion effects and also um, systematic risk. And then um, we are followed after that with Ivana Rufino from FNA, where she actually demoed for us um, a risk simulation software um, that actually assesses um, CCPs and uh, potential risks. So this was very interesting um, because it models shocks on uh, publicly available information. So I think it's using a Python script where it's calling a lot of information that's already online and then using that to build um, a simulation model um, for risk. And then it actually looked into um, what would happen in the case of um, a collapse of one CCP or of a, a financial crisis. So looking into maybe whether is there another CCP that could actually uh, then take over um, the, the network traffic of the crash CCP and whether the CCP actually has enough bandwidth and capacity to, to manage the newly acquired traffic. So we played around a lot with that software. And um, I think it's still work in progress. And um, so she also mentioned that at the for the time being, you can't trade um, on the model, but it provides a really good overview of um, the systematic risk that um, exists because of CCPs and um, its scale and magnitude. So I think softwares like this can actually provide a really good basis um, for policy direction to also see which markets need more CCPs and what regulatory environments um, that are required to prevent something like the financial crisis that we saw in 2008. And then um, we also had Basil Sanson, who's also a YSI um, organizer and scholar from the Un University of Warwick. And he also presented his work on systemic risks in financial uh, networks. So he really also something similar to uh, Ivana where he has modeled um, various network risks among CCPs that exist. And his um, framework is really looking into the contagion effects. Should there be a CCP failure, um, the intermediation of this risk and whether this risk can be um, diversified. Um, so that was all very interesting to see. Um, next slide, please, Adam. So that was actually the um, day one. So as mentioned, we had a lot of excellent speakers who were providing their research. And for me as a YSI uh, member, it was also very interesting to be in the room um, with these scholars to then directly ask them questions, also coming maybe from a now practicing private sector um, perspective. Um, and then on day two and day three, we had a nice opportunity to actually go to the derivatives forum in Frankfurt. So this forum, I think, has been happening for at least 10 years, and it's in different cities every year. And um, this year, we're fortunate that it was also in Frankfurt. And as YSI members, we had access to it. So we also had a really good um, intersection by the chief strategy officer of UREX. Um, UREX was actually the organizer of this forum. So it was really good to really hear everything from the horse's mouth. And he also re-emphasized that there definitely is a research gap when it comes to um, liquidity um, problems in financial market infrastructures, and also when it comes to uh, CCPs, because Eurex also launched um, its own CCP, and uh, general trading. So we investigated whether there could be down the, down the line in months to come a research partnership between Eurex and YSI. And I, I believe that conversation is still ongoing. But um, after that, we attended the forum. So the forum had uh, mainly uh, private sector professionals who were providing panel discussion, uh, networks, and also demos of their own uh, products. And I would say um, the context of this was pretty unique because I think it was the first forum um, since the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was uh, the first one again that was um, in person. And uh, there were a lot of things happening. So there was inflation, it was the beginning of inflation in the Eurozone. There was the invasion of Russia on Ukraine and also the rise of political dominance of China. So I would say a lot of the panel discussions always took this context into account. And I would say the themes were 24-7 uh, trading, AI at scale, optimal data usage and blockchain technologies. 
So these innovation um, discussions, I think they are important throughout all industries, but they were focusing mainly from the financial sector and mainly from the derivatives. And of course, CCPs were also a big topic. And then uh, we looked into uh, thematics, um, financial thematics, so sustainability and ESGs. Next slide, please, uh, Adam. So this is one of the many uh, sessions that took place. I just wanted to bring it up um, in today's debrief because I found it very interesting. The I think the first interesting thing about it is that it had uh, members who were working from the private sector. So people providing clearing, people using clearing, and then we also had regulators in the same panel discussion. And I think the first general theme of this uh, discussion were the perspectives in terms of regulation. Um, and I think um, from the regulator's point of view is that it's clear that there needs to be a thriving financial market, but we need to um, avoid any failures that come from CCPs, especially after identifying two uh, risks with UK CCPs and also um, the UK exiting um, the European Union. So UK CCPs are now viewed as third country CCPs. So trying to understand, but there are still the largest CCPs. So it's trying to understand um, how to manage that risk given that it's out of the EU jurisdiction, but how to still continue um, relying on UK CCPs. Um, and from the industry professionals perspective was that um, there's not a stable state because there's still regulation uh, conversations that are ongoing and there's no way to really know what is within the remit or not when it comes to CCP, which of course affects um, innovation and further development of CCPs. And I think um, the conversation was really who should then decide on the final regulatory framework of CCPs? Should it be market-driven? Should it be market led or should it be fully um, regula uh, regulatory driven, so maybe driven by ESMA, um, and whether that would be considered a, a cost relocation? So that was a very lively discussion. And um, yeah, I think what, where they really um, came together was also accepting that post -bre Brexit, um, the EU also needs to build its own robust and uh, competitive capital market and um, that there are still some challenges. Um, for example, the platform economy makes it difficult for newcomers. And um, also there still needs to be more products that are um, entered into uh, clearing. And I think the final um, consensus was that there just needs to be a credible way to communicate between all the stakeholders. Um, and there also needs to be um, more services offered um, by EU CCPs and um, yeah, to also encourage uh, public institutions, so not only private um, uh, institutions such as banks to, to clear in the EU, but also uh, public um, institutions who also have significant assets um, and trading that they do. Next slide, please, um, Adam. Thanks. Um, and this one I also added um, as just part of the recap, mainly because I work in, in the index business. So this was also an interesting um, um, panel discussion for me. And this was basically um, looking into um, thematic indices and what are the trends um, in this area. Um, so there are various approaches. This was also very interesting for me because it had, again, people who are consuming um, indices and um, organizations that are making indices. So we had um, the senior applied researcher from my organization. And we also had, I think, also an applied researcher from MSCI, one of the biggest um, index producers, just um, discussing some of the challenges um, from an organization point of view. And also, um, discussing what um, thematic indices are useful for. So the consensus here was that thematic indices are really important um, for structural products. Um, and just because something um, is on trend, so also just trying to identify between micro and mega trends. So um, another important point here is that uh, micro trends don't necessarily become mega trends, therefore not necessarily cannot be considered as a thematic 
Um, so for them, um, having a thematic is something that at least lasts for about uh, 10 years. So some of the trends when it comes to thematic indices are, of course, um, energy at the intersection of digitalization. So it's more or less green tech. And then um, ESG was also a very important one. And the consensus here was also moving away from or developing ESG further. So a lot from at to date, I think ESG thematic indices focus mainly on the climate side of things. So the E for environment. And now um, the idea is to move to also uh, monitoring uh, along social parameters and also governance. And um, this is also driven by inflation, supply chain blockages, um, which either improve or um, reduce the ability for to create more thematic indices. And I just added a fun fact here, and this is what I mentioned earlier, um, micro trends don't necessarily translate to mega trends. So at that time, um, metaverse was a really big topic on the news and generally in the tech, fintech uh, sector. But at, at that day, only 7% of the audience actually had invested in the metaverse. So that's the main recap of the three days we had a conference um, at Frankfurt last year. Um, I would say um, the key takeaways are definitely that there is more research required um, in liquidity and also financial market uh, infrastructures. Um, this, I think it's very important that this um, research is uh, inspired and also done in partnership with public sector and private sector. Um, so I think it's important to, as researchers to also understand what are some of the gaps, uh, research gaps required from the private sector and how can we meet those gaps or so also how can um, YSI meet those gaps. I think what, um, based on the all of the conversations, what also stood out for me is that within research, there are interdisciplinary opportunities. So for example, um, looking at fintech, looking at uh, political um, reassessments, looking at the evolution of uh, climate change and also technology and how that impacts um, liquidity or financial market infrastructures in general. So I think that's an interesting perspective to take on um, when doing research in this area. I think there's still um, a debate ongoing between private and public sector practitioners on requiring um, some form of stability or regulation or clear mandates versus having um, innovation that may, may or may not fit within the currently stipulated uh, mandates. Um, and uh, at that moment, we had discussed uh, the next steps for the liquidity project. So we were considering doing research um, with UREX, um, trying to understand what the gaps are. And I think at that time we were also playing around um, with the idea of having maybe an industry mapping um, when it comes to CCPs. So maybe to create a framework to see where um, CCPs fit in Europe. Um, that conversation is still ongoing. So there's still no clear um, direction on what will happen next. But in the meantime, um, Adam, maybe the next slide. In the meantime, I wanted to bring to your attention that we do have a liquidity project uh, um, conference for this year. And um, I think we are kicking off um, the engagement with these sessions in April. So as mentioned earlier, please stay, stay on for other sessions that may occur later this afternoon, but we will have um, in-person sessions in Frankfurt. Um, so th this is the timeline. So from the 21st of June to the 23rd of June, and we will also have a conference in Chicago on the 4th of October. So the topics that are envisioned for this workshop are CCPs, um, central bank digital coins, networks, the G20, and also collateral. Um, I believe the application for these year's conferences are already online. So I do encourage you, if you're very interested and have not applied, please do apply. I can share from my perspective that I had a really positive application experience. So I was part of YSI, um, I think for two years, but this was the first uh, on-site conference that I attended. And I wanted to leverage um, my current role in working in financial market infrastructures. 
Um, and that's why I applied to be part of the liquidity project, but also to attend um, this conference. We had a similar application process. We had three questions um, online. So what is your motivation? What are some of the research topics you would are interested in investigating? And uh, yeah, what does liquidity mean for you in your research? And then we had a conversation um, with the organizers. I had a call with Kiko. And then after that, um, when they had um, provided the seats for, for the applicants, um, we would provide a, tra a travel stipend to Frankfurt to attend the conference. So it was really smooth um, and really great. And I really encourage um, everyone to apply. So that's at the end of my uh, my recap. I hope you guys got a sense of, of the conference. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibula. It was, it was a very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. And also, uh, let me share our uh, email addresses uh, in case uh, you are interested, maybe uh, you could also send a message to us. But also, as uh, Sibulela mentioned, uh, the process uh, has started, the application process has started for the, this year's uh, event. And uh, yeah, we are waiting for the applications and the submissions. Thank you. And uh, maybe uh, let me ask if anyone from the participants uh, has a question which was told by Sibulela. I think it was very deep and, and very wide uh, uh, presentation. And, uh, and thank you also for sharing uh, your feedbacks on uh, the ind indices. Okay, Ajibola Akanji, thank you for joining and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I must thank the presenter for a very good job. She made a very wonderful presentation and uh, it sort of captures a whole lot of um, work that has been done by this group over a period of time, which culminated in the workshop that was held last year. Yeah, I can only congratulate the group for a job well done, but then I want to add some few things that in the area of further research, I think, um, the Global South, where I think the presenter emanates should also be considered. Because some of these things you are saying, they are very important, but they are, they are very emphasic in, 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 in countries of the Global South. You really see even PhD holders who can say, who have basic knowledge about it. So I, I will suggest with respect that Africa too should be considered as a place where some of these workshops will take place because we are in need of the knowledge accruable from this workshop. Then in the areas of uh, stability and innovation, cryptocurrencies is not something I will really encourage. This is because you find that laws in virtually all countries are not so supportive of cryptocurrencies. For, for example, here in Nigeria, the laws here does not support having uh, cryptocurrencies. That's not saying the law does not support financial uh, technology, et cetera. But in the area of cryptocurrency, even the banks will not deal with you once your account is linked to cryptocurrencies and the courts will not enforce it. So in that regard, I will, I will suggest also that we be a bit hesitant in the way we relate with cryptocurrency. Yes, in some countries, it might be the norm, but in other countries, it, that's not the case. So that's my contribution for now. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you to the presenter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining and for this contribution. Yeah, I agree on the point on the CCPs um, and them not being as mature in Africa. I think that was also something that came up during the conference. I think um, to date, we have two CCPs or maybe three um, CCPs in Africa and all of Africa, and they are all in uh, based in South Africa and Johannesburg. So definitely, and I mean, just looking at the size of the region and the potential for trade, so that definitely is an underserviced um, area. So I can only um, echo your point on needing more uh, knowledge uh, sharing 
and development, um, especially within CCPs in, in Africa. Thank you, Sibulala, for your response. Uh, anyone else? Uh, well, I would like also to, to thank all the presenters. It was really interesting. Uh, I started participating in the group in 2019 at the beginning. Then I changed a uh, career path. So I went to management consulting. I left kind of the economic side of things. And recently I joined, we, we created a startup uh, called Leaky. So we are back in the, in the track. I would like to ask if you have any plans uh, about some research apart from the CCP part that I'm truly interested in because part of our business plan is going to be highly impacted about uh, CCPs and liquidity uh, at a higher level. But we, are, uh, we're, we want to start making some research about the, the lower part of the liquidity. Uh, I, I think everybody here knows perfectly the money view of Professor uh, Merlin. So we part of our business uh, plan is based on the cre credit elasticity side uh, of the theory. And we would like uh, to, to make some research about the, the last part of the money creation, about the credit uh, side between companies and helping to the money creation, but not about the money creation, especially the credit side of uh, giving liquidity to the to the companies, especially small and medium enterprises uh, in Southern Europe. So I did all this introduction also to present myself kind of. Uh, the, the, the question is if you have plans in making some research on the credit side or just uh, focus, focusing in the more higher level and institutionalized part of the, of the liquidity. Thank you. Sibula, uh, if I may, let me, let me try to yeah. ask, uh, re reply. And uh, I think that Alex is, is here with us. Alex is uh, giving a lecture and he's uh, on, on the money view, Perry Merling's uh, famous uh, uh, framework. And uh, I think that the next session of the class is going to, to start in May. And uh, there are so many uh, 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 participants who are interested in doing some research. Uh, but YSI is not fully supporting uh, uh, researches per se. Uh, it it it, it prefer. I, I I'm not uh, I'm not talking on behalf of YSI, but uh, my my experience. It 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 prefers to to provide platforms and uh, sessions and uh, the network and uh, IT background uh, to meet and discuss and uh, let's uh, find some motivation incentives and. Um, uh, yes, uh, and I'm 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 happy that you you uh, since you mentioned that you 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 joined uh, YSI quite a long time ago and uh, you are considering to 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 return to this uh, uh, community. Uh, I think that uh, your your knowledge uh, being a, a, a consultant, uh, I think that uh, always good to have uh, some academic and. Uh, a practitioner background, and, and if that comes from the same person, that is the, the, the best. Uh, Alex, uh, do you want to, to comment? Are you still here? Sorry, I, I'm not able to, to, to see the participants. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, About I don't the know. credit, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of, uh, uh, I think I agree with what you said that, you know, it makes sense that um, YSI is more for kind of having a platform um, in terms of supporting research, um, I don't know. We do that. We do the MOOC every year. Um, so if you have people in your group or on your team who want to get up to speed um, or refreshed on the Money View, um, we're starting it up again. Um, the end of May, we have uh, an online group. There's a there's a project on um, the Financial Stability Working Group, and we're going to be doing discussing the two lectures and one reading uh, every week, and we're just going to go through the MOOC. Um, there's some updates that we've made to it. Uh, right now, I'm actually 
uh, Perry Merling is turning the MOOC into a book. Uh, that's what he's working on right now. And he's teaching uh, the class this semester, and I've been sitting in on it um, because he's right here in Boston. Um, so he's kind of going through and having a class discussion on each of the lectures and how he's going to update them and that kind of thing. So we're going to incorporate some of that as well. Um, so um, this is kind of basic stuff, you know, kind of compared to what you're doing. But if anyone's interested in the uh, foundational money view stuff, um, definitely feel free to free to join that. Well, nice to hear that. Uh, well, I think maybe I'm going to have a refresh <laughs> on the on the Monday view. It's been quite five five years, six years now. Maybe the last time I I took the course. Uh, okay, thank you very much for for your answers. Um, well, perfect. Uh, so on the credit side, uh, if you're interested, uh, I'm, we we will. We are a group of six people now in the in the company. We're going to start making some kind of uh, research on our side, and we're going to to share it. Uh, if you are interested, then we can talk. I don't know within the group uh, how to propose webinars and that kind of thing. But uh, we we would like to to make to use the network and to share. Uh, make it not not that open source to be. Uh, honest of course but absolutely to share knowledge to to have discussions uh we are we're willing to make a, that kind of communication uh, regarding the research so maybe then i don't know whose email can i can i take to to just to exchange some words and ideas okay perfect thank you very much well, thank, thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. And I think that uh, if there is no more question, and uh, let me again, thank you for Sibulele's uh, great presentation. And uh, please uh, stay with us because there are three more uh, uh, sessions today which are approaching. And uh, I'm going to, to stop the recording now, If uh, or Alex, maybe you can... <laughs>